This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, and we are back from a trip to Montana and uh, getting back into the podcasting. I think Brad might still be. Are you still on the road, Brad? Or are you all the way back? I'm home for a day, then I'm back out. Oh, okay. So he's Brad just never stops being on the road, but I can tell these days. Nomad Brad. Yeah. Uh, the Montana trip was great. Um we still haven't quite managed to get the uh, the view we want of the current ripples in Camas Prairie, uh, you know, with, with the sunlight. But it's still, it was a beautiful trip. Uh, Montana is, of course, gorgeous. And uh, I think the year before we did it in the spring, this time we did it closer to the fall. Uh, I couldn't tell any difference except there was less water this time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was still just right. as green, just as beautiful. Um. But yeah, it was it was really an amazing trip. It's a it's interesting. I would I again I've said this before, I would say it again. It's not as not maybe not as like visually mind blowing as the Scablands, but you still have to see the Montana you still have to see all this stuff in Montana to get the scale and understand that this is where this stuff is supposed to have started. Uh but there are beautiful canyons and the, the current ripples is amazing. You know, looking at Lake Ponderé and just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Flathead Lake and then the the moraines. All that stuff is just really awesome to give you a picture of the size. You know, we're like, okay, we're looking at one lobe of this enormous ice sheet, and it dumped all this material here, and we're standing on top of it looking out at this hole that's now a lake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really yeah. amazing. Right. And we pulled in the, the drumlin field also. Mm -hmm. Took a yeah. big dog leg almost all the way to the Canadian border to see the drumlins in Eureka in the that's southern right. end thought, of the Rocky Mountain Trench. That was pretty outstanding. I thought we were there looking at cows. Oh yeah, that's right. We were accused of looking at cows. The farmer was. <laughs> I, I still, I, I tell you, I, I was chuckling over that for the rest of the day. I mean, I'm thinking, here's this old this farmer up there, and what is it? Four, four passenger buses pull up, and what forty five people get out, and they're all yeah. lined up. They're looking down at the drumlins, and then the cows come up. The three cows, <laughs> and he thought. <laughs> <laughs> that we all pulled over and got out to yeah. watch his three yeah, cows. Yeah, you see cows, go to the county fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that still kills me. <laughs> well, yeah, these are the most interesting cows. These people have never seen cows before. <laughs> They're from, uh, what, somewhere. <laughs> they don't have cows where they come from. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, that was, they're all uh, from New York City. They've never seen a cow. <laughs> yeah. Yo, oh, oh, we thought they were elk. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that was an elk herd. I think so, the cows came to look at us. <laughs> yeah, we well, they did, yeah. There, were, there were no cows there, and we're looking at the drumlins, and suddenly these cows come up over the hill and stand there watching us. Yeah. That farmer was accusing us. I mean, it was the cows that were there to look at us. Yeah, I think so just to provide a little context for the listener, you know, we we were looking for kind of a, a, a an overlook so we could see down onto the Drumlin Swarm, and we kind of just it was a country road. And we just pulled off there with the with the what about seven or eight vehicles we had. Yeah, yep. yeah. Right. So we're all lined up there, and uh, we're looking down at the Drumlins, and it just so happened it was a cow pasture, <laughs> and th three cows came up to see what the hell we were up to and the farmer came out thought we had all stopped there to see his cow he's coming, gonna be telling of that story about for the rest of his life yeah but this is city show, folk <laughs> this just goes to show what you always say is like all these people are living here and they don't even know what they're living on right, right. they don't most well, likely probably most of them don't realize that these formations oh, no. they're living on or how they were created and this guy's just thinking we're looking at cows. <laughs> well, I told the one guy, he said, what are you all doing? I was like, we're looking at the drumlins. The what? 
<laughs> yeah. All these glacial hills are uh, bzz, he sped yeah. away. Just takes off. Yeah. Was it Ben that said we should be telling him we're from the government we're here to build an interstate? Yeah, that's what he told me. I should. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna build a highway right said, through yeah. there. Yeah, and we're gonna <laughs> put on this is gonna right through. <laughs> and we're gonna have a, a landing strip right over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh I'll be boy! Quicker next time. But that yeah. you know what? That's why it is gratifying when you do run into somebody that actually knows a little something. And we do. I there was at least one fella. Where was it that we ran into? And he definitely knew what was going on around there. And his oh yeah, his, yeah. When we that? came out, when we came out of the uh, the first stop at the Yokelops Point, the local guy at the gas station there. Yeah, he knew what was up. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Matt, right. Matt, maybe. Um, hey, buddy, if you're out there. Yeah, that and then we at, at all. Okay, and then there was, uh, yeah, we we uh, one of the last days we stopped in for gas, and I went in. What place was it? And the guy it, behind the counter, he, I was getting the look. So, you know, the look, like, aren't you Jerry Garcia? Aren't you? <laughs> aren't you Jerry Garcia or his younger brother? Anyway. <laughs> no, but it's funny. I start getting recognized in places where I just wouldn't have even imagined that I would get recognized, like in stopping at the convenience store in, you know, Montana. And the guy behind the counter recognized, oh, man. We, and he, of course, he knew who you guys were. He's been watching a podcast. So you never okay. know where you're going to run into somebody. Well, yeah, there was a, what was it the Scablands trip? We were, the sheriff. <laughs> we were having lunch, and then the cop car comes up, and I'm, I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, so right, I thought we right. were getting busted yeah, by the show. I gotta walk over here to talk to this guy. And... <laughs> nope. He's like, Can, is that Randall Carlson? <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> yeah, we were on the way to Step to Butte. You yeah. didn't si uh -huh. you didn't sign anything, Randall, did you? From the cop? Just don't just don't sign anything. No, okay. <laughs> Can I get just, your autograph? Uh, not just on don't that. just advice. don't say anything. Don't sign, you know. You know yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he says, Are you Randall Carlson? I just feel I don't answer questions. <laughs> right. I don't answer questions. You guys here on a on a tour? I don't answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Russ and Kyle you got with you, the Serpent Brothers? I oh, don't yeah. answer questions. Yeah, 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 that's them. <laughs> Talk to my manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent trip. Yeah, it, it was. was we'll do we'll do more, but next year we're going to do a different one. Yeah, well, so, yeah, we in, talked about some of that last last episode. Well, you know, interestingly, I'm going to be do do this disclosure fest, and one of the speakers there has been making studies, and apparently there's a lot of paranormal type phenomena in the Columbia Gorge. I had not heard that. I hadn't either. Like Sasquatch, like, uh, but nearby, but not other things. Well, that's one of his. I think that's covered in his presentation, but it's a bunch of. There's a bunch of stuff. I was just looking very briefly, but um, yeah, that. Well, what do they mean paranormal? Like lights or ghosts or. Well, beyond normal. Like... Beyond oh, normal. Well, we got a newbie. Like what? Like what? Uh, well, I can tell you in a second here. I mean, if you're going to be that way about it, Mike. I was just going to mention it as a, and then, you know, move on, but no. Okay. Let's see here. I bet you I can get it up in about a second here. I don't, you don't remember his name. Let's see. But yeah, he, uh, in fact, uh, one of the, uh, publicists and producers wanted to know if I'd be willing to have a, uh, uh, do a interview with this guy. Cause of, on a, on a, um, and I got, I didn't remember his name, but uh, I should have it right here. Well, I know you've you've talked a lot about the Hudson Valley, and there was some really famous oh mass yeah UFO sightings in the Hudson Valley as well. Oh yeah, yep. yeah, yep. And it could be, you know, not, not for tonight's uh, conversation too much, but we certainly could get into some of the interesting work. Uh, I'm thinking primarily of Paul Devereaux's work, you know, the earthquake lights and things, and other phenomena that's well documented to have occurred in association with seismic seismicity um let's see here yeah, we should. that was like episode two we we did talk so about that but it certainly would be worth more in 102 yeah we certainly be worth revisiting 
There was a story on CNN recently about earthquake lights. Uh, the uh, was it down in Peru, south somewhere South America, I think. There were uh, there was one of the few recorded instances of, of earthquake lights. It was on video. Uh huh. So yeah. I mean, they're real. Yeah, I mean they are definitely real. Um, it, it, the the story said that it was one of those things that people often heard tales about, but there was little documentation. But uh, this was a uh, one of the first instances of video recording on of earthquake lights it was really impressive yeah okay. it's great it's like uh it's like ball lightning or the giant that's, squid right it's yeah, like that's what i was gonna go with stories about them lightning. for yeah, yeah for a long time but no actual evidence until or anything other than anecdotal evidence until more recently mm -hmm. uh well i have here it, what are you looking for the paranormal stuff in columbia gorge yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's see. There's going to be live show. Okay. Okay. So I've got it here. The it's cryptids, UFOs, and portals. Um, James Zuzuski, Zuzuski, uh former volunteer search and rescue EMT, wildland firefighter, and mountain guide. James. Oh, this is spelled differently. Sub Subski. So they've got his name misspelled here. Anyways, we'll discuss the wide array of paranormal activity in the Columbia River Gorge, including the Clickitat, Ape Cat, Sasquatch, UFOs, portals, and small humanoids. So wind you know. wind surfing aliens, don't forget them. Ah. They're bad. So apparently uh no no wind resistance. Hobbits and ape cats? What's an ape cat? I don't know. Look it up. Click, click a tat. K L I C K I T A T. Click a tat, ape cat. An ape cat? You ever heard of that, Kyle? No, but I can guess what it is based on what the it? name. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the Columbia Community it's Connection. A Strange panther-like creature prowls the gorge. The ebony ape cat. Oh, really? I, by, I... by Cole Goodwin. Realtors warn their clients that they may encounter an indescribable black creature while visiting remote properties in Snowden. A driver in Klickitat Canyon spots a hulking black beast with a long tail lurking na near roadside homesteads at dawn. Rumors have, rumors have swirled in Trout Lake for close to three decades about a family of sable-colored mutated cougars. These paranormal reports received at Mar Margie's Outdoor Store all seem to be describing the same thing, a beast that is being called the Ebony Ape Cat. Okay, well, so this guy, maybe he's been looking into that, and he's an expert on that. So that he's going to discuss... Well, the click a tat, ape, ape cat, and Sasquatch, and UFOs, portals, and small humanoids. There you go. I don't know why, but the first thing that popped into my mind when I read that was soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was looking That's for a way to do soul sighting. <laughs> yes. he, he might have been spotted and. Columbia Gorge at one point. <laughs> yes, well, he was certainly spotted in Montana. A small humanoid. <laughs> yes. For those that don't know, Kyle's son is sold. And is he seven yet? Yes, he's seven, yeah. He's seven. What a great age. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. I'm glad. Yeah, he, he was. He was a lot of fun. Um, And his name is Soul? Soul, yes. Yep, I we like got it. to... He got to travel with us, stay up late with the boys, jamming out. Yeah. You know, yeah. It was a it was a lot of fun. He's a trip, a lot of fun. So uh yeah, yeah. so the tour uh will be based out of Columbia Gorge for at least three nights. So yeah, who knows what we might see now that we know there's options. Well, I'll be meeting this guy at the uh disclosure fest on the tenth and eleventh, I believe it is tenth and eleventh of November. So it ought to be fun. I'll be out in Vegas. Is there any way you could get out there, Brad, and we take off for a couple of days and explore? I have to look. It sure sounds tempting. Well, we'll, we'll see what we got a little time to think about it. But um, 
So yeah, I'd probably do that. And I mentioned to you guys earlier that um, you know, I'm gonna do a panel with Scott Walter and Tim Hogan. And Tim Hogan has got some really interesting things. You know, he's been over in Egypt and you know, he is the head of the International Order of the Templars. Right? You guys know Tim Hogan. You yeah. met him, right? Or you you know of him, right? Um I yes. met him. Okay, so he's good man, smart, done some amazing research, amazing traveling, and he's been um in Egypt getting into places maybe even Ben can't get into. Um but anyways, he's supposed to be showing some photographs of things that have never been photographed before. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. So he's going to be up in, uh, I know he's going to do a presentation with the, the boys at the lodge in Nashville, Warren and Ryan. Right. Um, so I made October. Yeah. Been like so, three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to try to get up there for that. Uh, so yeah. So Montana. Awesome. I have to agree. And if I had any criticisms, nothing really other than the fact that it was when we did the spring, when the water, we, we came in there right after a couple of days of heavy rain. And yeah, it was mid June, mid June. Yes. And that yep. made well, it, it was, I mean, it was flooding. They had yeah, it was yeah. severe Record flooding rains last for time. two days. Yeah. So it was interesting to get that perspective to see some, you know, like the, 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 the water going through the Clark Fork river there, Clark Fork Canyon. And by the, um, by the dam, um, not the Noxon Dam, the um, Cabinet Gorge, Cabinet, Cabinet Gorge, Gorge Dam. Yeah. That that to me, I still got that vision in my head of that incredible pressure. And and what I saw there to me was really an important is was great because it was almost how I was envisioning the origin of the bowl of uh, Boulder Park up in the uh, Scablands. Of course, you guys have seen and how those boulders got transported from the Columbia valley up there north of there down to be spread out thousands of them on the plateau but i think we would have seen exactly something similar is that you had this tremendous gush of water under enormous pressure coming under the ice sheet and then when that hits the cross at, at right angles to the to the columbia it just rips just rips and and remember how the water was shooting up into that arc like that, uh, you can picture the same thing, except now the wave is coming down all over the Waterville Plateau, charged with these gigantic 10, 100, 200, 300 ton boulders. Anyhow, um, that will be, we'll be back at the Channel Scablands in May, correct? Yes. Do we have any dates for the uh, Columbia Gorge tour? Yeah, Not it's, yet. it's mid September. Same same week basically as we just did Montana. Oh, okay. That's like right. the uh fifteenth through the twenty first or fourteenth, twentieth day, yeah. Mid well, September twenty fourth. Well, that'll give me some time to look into this paranormal paranormal activity dimension of it. Um but hey, if there was a place that could possibly be prone to that kind of thing, the Columbia Gorge is I can still remember my very first impression of the gorge. When I was 19 years old and went through there in 1970, I was like, I, I almost felt like a character out of Gulliver's Travels. Like I was in, what was the, uh, what was the, the land of the giants? Remember, you guys know the story, right? You guys are literate enough to know the story of the... Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Travels. Yeah, I don't first, remember the name of the land of the, the giants. Lands. It was with, it was Brabim, Brabo, Brabin, Brabin, something like that. Lillipu Lillip the Lilliputians was the land where he went and he was a giant. And then that was followed by going to the land where it was the giants and he was just this little diminutive thing. And that was kind of the feeling Bro. I got through the going through the Columbia Gorge is that everything was on such an outsized scale. And of course, having no concept at that time of my life of what actually happened in the gorge. But now that I do. Yeah, because everything that happened there that left its imprint in the gorge in that landscape was gigantic and outsized. Brobdingnag? Brobdingnag. B-R-O-B-D-I-N-G-N-A-G. Yeah, Brobdingnag. 
Yeah. Excuse <laughs> us for not remembering that. Yeah. Sorry, Randall. Jeez, I tell you, I'm just you guys. I'm <laughs> The letdown, you guys. I, I said I know you guys are literate. Doable. Negative attaboys. Yeah, yeah. It was full of the Brobdingnagians. <laughs> and of course. And, who were apparently yes. giants. They were colossal. Yes, they were colossal. And everything about the land was colossal. Yeah. And you get the, the, my, the, my point, my analogy here was that that's kind of how I felt. Like I was in this land of colossal things, of gigantic yeah. things. Yeah. And that, of course, was the first year that I went across the scab lamps, but I don't remember anything about the scab lamps um, too much at all. Maybe even drove across them at night. I don't remember. But um, I didn't learn about them until like five or six years later. I learned about the channel scab lamps from um, the book uh, on Atlantis by Cedric Leonard that we talked about. He had the the uh, he had a little chapter in there, and a section of the chapter was about the ch the channel scablands, and I think that book came out in 1978, and I probably read it about then. And then reading it, I go, okay, yeah, I've been out there. I remember going across that, but I didn't know anything about it. But that was my first awareness, I think, 1978, and reading that book. Um, it's uh, Atlantis, you can look it up. C uh, Cedric Leonard was the author. It's actually a pretty good book. And he gives a fairly coherent and scientific discussion of catastrophism in there. He has a chapter that's actually called The Catastrophe of 12,000 B.C. Or no, ten. The, the, I'm sorry, The Catastrophe of 10,000 B.C., which would have made it around 12,000, which, of course, is close enough for government work. And, you know, in the 70s, you know, and really, when you look at the Younger Dryas, Lower Dry Younger Dryas boundary that has now been precisely dated to somewhat less than 12,900, actually 12,860 or something around there, give or take. And if you go back 40 or 50 years to the 1970s, well, being within a millennium certainly is, is going to be close enough. But, of course, what we now know, I think, is that what we're not looking I think it's an oversimplification to think of it as just a singular catastrophe. I think we're looking at 3,000 years that saw a succession of catastrophes. And the end result is that when it was finally over at Meltwater Pulse 1B at 11,600, at that point, the planet had completely shifted gears from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. Um, so what is... What, Quest for Atlantis. That by was it. Quest R. Cedric Leonard. Yeah, that was the book, and it's actually a pretty good book. It's a good introductory book. People are asking me what are some introductory books. That's a, actually not a bad one. It's a little bit dated, um, but hey, what, what was the publication date? Was it seventy eight? Mm. Doesn't matter, but it was around then. I could find out. Uh. And he had a chapter in there, like I said, the matter the, books. 1979. 79. Oh, gosh, I was off by a year. There goes my credibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your credibility is shot there. Just shot. Yeah. Just shot. False claims. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, that is. I wonder if it's still in print. Uh, I still, no. It's I not. So. We, don't, still, we don't need print anymore. You got the internet. It's, yeah. It's, it's, you can just download well, it on the Amazon clouds. has one paperback used for $80. Oh my god! Uh, really, really? Yeah. Somebody scanned it for sure. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, I have a paperback, and hey, if I signed it, could I get one hundred and eighty dollars for it? <laughs> no, yes. but I do. I have the. I have that original. Jesus, I better not talk about this. I've got some pretty amazing books that I do know are worth lots of money because they're rare out of print. And you know what I. Th it, it it makes me think, okay, these books, some of these books are so interesting, so profound, and so important, and so relevant, but nobody's reading them. That's why they're not getting reprinted, because nobody's reading them. What are they reading these days? What kind of BS? We do have some friends with an audiobook company. We do, don't we? Yeah, That's true, yeah. Darren and Graham. Yeah, that's the oh, kind of book. That, this would be a good one for them to do. 
Yeah, right? it's the kind of book you want. Something that's not many people maybe are familiar with, but that has good information in it. It's nonfiction. Yep. Well, yeah. Uh, so it's that, probably pretty obscure and, you know, no demand for it. Yeah. Well, that was the first place that I ever remember hearing about the Missoula floods and the Channel Scab Land was that book that you're looking at right there. But yeah, that was a good one. Um, and the other one that I read right after that, I believe was 1980, called The Secret of Atlantis by Otto Mook. And he was a German physicist, and he proposed that the Carolina Bays were caused by uh, a fragmenting asteroid that outer layers of it spalled off, and all of these fragments splattered across the southeastern coastal plain, but the main chunk of asteroid went and hit into the Indian Ocean. And, and that was the basic thesis of his catastrophe that wiped out Atlantis. Mm. And the original object I thought was interesting in retrospect because he was speculating that it was six miles in diameter. And that's exactly the diameter of the KT object that took out the dinosaurs. And those papers were published in 1980, the same year or a year after Otto Mook published his book, where he's speculating that Atlantis was destroyed by a cosmic impact into the Atlantic Ocean. Are you by any chance looking that up, Russ? Which one is it? Do you want me to look M up? Mook is like muck with a umlaut, yes. I think. Yes. M-U-C-K. Otto Mook, the secret of Atlantis. So the secret. I'm trying to trace how we got back here. We started, you started talking about the Montana trip and what was not so great. And that we had the big rains in June and yeah, I'm trying to retrace. Um, <laughs> well, Mook. The, how we got here. Well, the oh, channel the scab internet, lands. Well, because around. if I hadn't read Cedric Leonard's book, it's possible we would have never done a tour to the channel scab lands. Right. Well, there it is. I'm sure I would have come come to it sooner or later. But yeah, I mean, that was my first exposure to the Channel Scablands, and then it became a topic of interest in further research. So for the next 20 years, I was researching it, learning everything I could about it. And in 1998, Bradley and I, with um, our friend Wilbur Adcock and oh, um, yeah. Bill Bill Phillips made our first recon, scientifically oriented recon, to the Channel Scablands. And that was great. I have great memories about that first trip. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I'm wondering if you went across, if it was I-90 at that point when you went in 1970 or 71. Right, 70. you, re you really wouldn't have seen hardly right. any Scablands. You would have been real close to Frenchman's Coulee. Yep. And you would have gone by Sprague Lake, mm -hmm. but you really wouldn't have seen too much on right. I-90 other than going down into the Columbia River Gorge there mm -hmm. where you cross it at that. The, well, that's why the I, lake, the, that big lake might not even have been there behind the dam in 1970. Right. Right. Yeah. Which, which is probably why I don't have much memory of that, but I do have very distinct memory and impressions of the Columbia Gorge. Because we came in, we came in driving from the east, so we drove, you know, okay. down the Columbia Gorge, at, and, we, and then I remember we stopped and stayed in Portland for three or four days, and then we went up to Seattle, and then we went out to the Olympic Peninsula and camped out. Under um, a picnic table, you told us about that? Yes, under a picnic table. A miserable night spent under the pitch, wet and shivering under a picnic table. But it was worth it. Uh, did you find anything uh, on Otto Mook, The Secret of Atlantis? I see it on, they also have it on Amazon. It's, they're all used, paperback versions. Um, this one was also published in 1979. Okay, yeah. So the, By Pocket yeah. Books. Uh, the reviews are great. People are just like, this. even today, this book is excellent. Uh -huh. uh, geology, historical geology, climatology. And links to myths passed on by ancient civilizations. Uh, 
So yeah, it looks good, but I don't see they don't seem to have a digital version or any new ones. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, I it, I thought it was uh, both of those books back to back were were really good books. I think I read the one I read the Led, Cedric Leonard book first, followed by the Otto Mook book, and the Otto Mook book was the first place I really began to shift my thinking because up to that point. You know, I had met um, Richard Noon, who was writing five five two thousand, and you know his whole scenario was pole shift, based upon Charles Hapgood. And you guys, of course, are familiar with Charles Hapgood, yeah, right. Haven't you even done a uh, a Serpent Brothers podcast or something where you've talked about? Hapgood? Yes, we did an eleven part series on Path uh, of the Pole. Yeah, Path of the Pole. Oh well, yeah. okay then. I knew you guys had done something. So yeah. yeah. I was introduced to that through this work of Richard Noon, who's no longer with us. And he was the one that was predicting that the world was going to end on May 5th of the year 2000. And, uh, of course, last time I checked, that hadn't happened. But um, anyways, his book was selling quite well up until May 5th of 2000. And I don't know, it may have sold one copy since then. No. Oh, well, um, I just, everyone, anyone listening to this, they only had one left. I ordered it. So you guys are screwed. I'm getting this book, Secret of Atlantis. <laughs> Did you mine. really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it claimed that there was only one copy left. You never know. But, like, I ordered it. It was $9. So, yeah. One copy one. in yeah. the world. Yeah. The last used yeah, paperback. There's one more copy. It's going to be $85. They have <laughs> they have hardcovers. Yeah. Oh, if you guys want it, I'll sell it to you for $100. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> They have our covers though. I just ordered the last paperback version. Uh, okay. they had. So I'm definitely going to read this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that was the first place I ever heard of the Carolina Bays. And Cedric Leonard's book was the first I'd ever heard of the channel Scabbling. So in 1979, the three teams, including the Alvarez team that published their paper in 1980, were writing their papers, but it hadn't come out yet. So a year after, Otto Mook's book, where he's proposing that a six-mile asteroid hit the Earth. Of course, it wouldn't have been six miles when it hit the Atlantic Ocean because so much of it had spalled off. And, he's, and I believe, and when you read it, you can clarify this for me. If memory serves me correctly, he had the, uh, he had the asteroid coming in from the Northwest, right? So that the path in of the asteroid was more or less parallel to the long axes of the Carolina Bays. Then large sections of the outer layers of the asteroid spalled off, broke up, and that those fragments, thousands and thousands of fragments, rained down over the coastal plain of the southeast, creating the Carolina Bays. The nucleus of the um, asteroid then plunged into the Atlantic Ocean. And he has found a feature on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean that he believes was a remnant impact site. And this is how he theorizes the, the uh, you know, the civilization of Atlantis was destroyed. Now, a year later, here comes the Alvarez team writing a, a, a major scientific paper, game-changing paper, uh, extraterrestrial impact at the KT boundary, where they're proposing a six-mile asteroid hit the Earth and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, which, so what I was getting at there is reading his, up to that point, I've been probably immersed in the idea of catastrophism since, since 74, 75, when I read, um, probably the first catastrophist I read was Emmanuel Velikovsky, right? And you guys have probably read Velikovsky, yep. right? And it's, it was his earth and upheaval that made the biggest impression on me. Yeah. And that was the one that actually has stood the test of time. His documentation of the geology and paleontology and mythology of catastrophism was really was, was a, a major milestone. Even though he went off into the fringe when he started talking about Mars and Venus being disgorged from Jupiter and all of this, and he earned the enmity of the astronomical and astrophysical communities who savaged his work. But his work really is two parts. One, the documentation of the evidence for catastrophism, both from the scientific realm as well as from the traditional and mythical realm. That was one thing. But then the other thing was his attempt to explain 
the catastrophism. What was the trigger? What was the cause? And that's where, you know, I still think his astrophysics went way off the rails. But nonetheless, a lot of people read Velikovsky and isn't, uh, to my knowledge, isn't the electric universe kind of an outgrowth of yeah, Velikovskyism? So. Yeah, yep. a bit. Yep. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. I thought there was some link there from decades back. Anyways, a lot yeah. of people were introduced to catastrophe and the links between uh, geology and paleontology, archaeology and mythology, which to me was very valuable. But the point is, is that I guess I was trying to make was that following his work, he proposed a pole shift caused by a comet passing by the Earth or Mars or Venus. I've forgotten which now. Um, and then... I encountered, I met Richard Noon, who was writing the book on 55-2000, and it was, it was a hodgepodge. Richard is no longer with us. Um, he's the only person that I've ever heard of that um, he got depressed uh, when the world didn't end on May 5th of the year 2000. Um, and he developed a drinking problem and got dementia, and he's gone now, but he mainly played an important role, even as though I read his book, it was a hodgepodge that just was not coherent. It was this and that. He took everything in the kitchen sink and threw it all together. But he was drawing very heavily on the work of Charles Hapgood. And what he was predicting was that May 5th of the year 2000, there was going to be a planetary alignment. And because the Antarctic ice cap had grown so big, it was causing an instability. and this planetary alignment was going to act on the crust of the earth and the Antarctic ice cap caused the, it to be unstable and the crust would slip a la Charles Hapgood. And this was supposed to happen on May 5th of the year 2000. Well, interestingly, I'm like, nah, really a planetary alignment. So I had been studying some astronomy and I had my, um, my ephemera, back then and so i started looking in there and finding that that the planetary alignment he was invoking didn't seem to be me to be that huge of a deal that there's been many planetary alignments without necessarily triggering a catastrophe but what happened was is not long i probably even before he got the book published i went to a a, a used library book sale and there was a hard copy a hardback copy of path of the pole for like a buck or something. So obviously I snatched it and then I read the book and you know, he's got an extensive bibliography in there, like maybe over 300 references anyway. So I made a project over the next year or two to like hunt down as many of his references as I could. So this would have been between 78 and 80. So come, come to 79, I'm still thinking pole shift, pole shift. But the more I'm learning, the less plausible cold pole shift seems to be. And then, you know, Otto Mook's book comes out. I read that in 79, and now he's talking about asteroid impact. So now my thinking turns, begins to shift in that direction. And then the following year, 1980, you know, there were three separate papers that came out. The most famous is... um. Is the is the Alvarez paper, uh, Walter and his father Louis Alvarez and their team who discovered the radium layer uh, at the KT boundary in Italy um, in the in seventy eight or seventy nine, and they published their paper in eighty, and they propose a six mile asteroid, but they don't know where it is. So the, other than the fact that somewhere on the Earth was impacted by a six mile asteroid, because based upon the, the concentrations of iridium that I think by the time they had published their paper in 80, they had found the iridium layer in Denmark and New Zealand. So from that, they were able to uh, infer that the entire planet had probably been blanketed in iridium dust. Well, and given the concentrations and, and mass of iridium dust they found, they extrapolated backwards of how much how much would this total iridium be if the whole planet had been blanketed roughly? Then how big of an asteroid would you need to have to deliver that much iridium to Earth's atmosphere? And the result when they did their calculations was a six-mile asteroid. So I remember reading that paper and and then 
thinking, well, that's Otto Mook was saying. he I don't, To my knowledge, he didn't talk about iridium, but a six-mile asteroid. Of course, then as I begin to learn more about the, the impact consequences at the KT boundary, I realized, well, if a six-mile asteroid had struck the Earth a mere 12,000 years ago or so, we probably wouldn't be here to talk about it. So something happened, but it wasn't that severe. I still kind of like both ideas. I mean, if you, I too. we went through Hapgood and, and, you know, Hapgood was in some cases at pains to say like, this is not like a, uh, a massively fast catastrophic action. This pole shift, he mm -hmm. thought mm -hmm. that it would take thousands of years. He, he basically describes it near the end of the book as like, think of it like an accelerated tectonic movement. Yeah. You know, and so it, he's like, it just it just moves faster. You'll have more earthquakes, more volcanoes, mm -hmm. but it isn't like uh, a, cat, a a catastrophic event that only takes a couple of days or weeks. But I have right. a question for you about. I thought one of the most com compelling things was the uh, presence of trees in like tundra and stuff that can't that can't survive with the le with the amount of sunlight. That these northern latitudes get. Mm -hmm. How do you explain yeah. that? Like there were forests up there that, if they did, they just doesn't get enough light with that being that high. How did they well, live there? Well, I thought I, that was really compelling in terms of it a, is. the crust it moving is. up there. At least that tectonic plate shifting mm -hmm. north. Well, and then when you look at the maps of the distribution of the North American ice complex, the Laurentide and yeah. the Cordilleran. Yes, I th I... You, you you take the center of the ice mass, and it's pretty much Hudson Bay. Right. Yeah. Now here right. you've got ice thousands of feet thick down to like the forty eighth, forty seventh parallel in America, crossing the Canadian border. But then it more or less terminates at the Arctic Circle, and then you cross the Arctic Ocean, and you're in Siberia, and it was much more diminished ice mass <laughs> over there. Yeah. And yeah. you apparently had this whole ecosystem, Ber Beringia, that reached from Alaska across uh, the Bering Straits into Siberia that was densely populated right. with, with megafauna. And, of course, for this, for this large population of mega megafauna, you had to have plenty of biomass for them to consume. To, to you know, maintain the, the big herbivores like the mammoths and the woolly rhinos and all of the other animals that lived up there that then sustained the predators. So, I mean, there had to be a whole functioning, uh, high productive ecosystem during the Ice Age. How do you explain that? I don't know. I still grapple I with that. that. I've, yeah. I feel like there's still a lot of elements of his. It's just the way he looked at it that are very compelling. And it's the data that he's analyzing. Now, his, his, uh, Hapgood's, all of his ideas, you know, maybe he's got some problems with these ideas, but I feel like it's still a compelling argument that has, you know, a lot of these questions he has have, have not been answered. No, yeah, they I think, I think the biggest, like the, the strongest argument against his general overall idea that I've seen people make is that. You know that the tectonic movement was still in its infancy of being considered at the time that he was putting together the book. Yeah, and so people were like a lot of the stuff that he points out as being strange in the book can just be explained by a gradual, very slow tectonic shifting. Right, the stuff about the 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 massive ice sheets in southern India and Africa that you know he was pointing out, like, look at how do you get ice down here. You know, or ice in, right. in areas where it seems to be not only is it down in the south, but it, it's it's flowing in the wrong direction, right? It's coming from the wrong way. It starts in the south, it goes north. Uh, well, if you if you actually take the more or less the center of the ice mass, which is probably on the western side of Hudson Bay, where the, the ice is the yeah, I'm talking about old ice, uh, long gone like old ice. I get no, that very, right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But it, let's say you plant. A, a pole there, then you draw a circle around it, um, the size of the Arctic Circle around the present day North Pole. It pretty much encompasses the ice, the yes. Laurentide, Fennoscandian, and Cordilleran ice within right. that circle. Yeah. So, um, what do you think? I mean, you think it still might be possible, like his ideas? Well, okay. So, 
my thought, and again, this is not mature in the sense that I've really followed up the physics of it. It's it's really still a kind of a speculative notion here, but I think it it pretty much follows the laws of geophysics, which is this. You see, the question is, is first of all, let's assume that there is some component of truth to the uh, pole shift idea. If it's a 3,000-year process, though, is that going to be adequate to explain the catastrophic extinctions, the the gigantic floods, the, the things that we've seen that are clearly on such a huge scale, you know, how how if the if it takes three thousand years for that shift to occur, are we gonna see floods on this on the scale of the channel scab lands? No, that's no, but that's why we're saying we like both. They're not mutually exclusive, right? Yeah. Like it like could a an impact actually trigger, trigger sort of the more rapid movement. Yeah. Okay. I see. Now I think we're getting on on, on a, a feasible pathway here. Yeah. The question is, 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 and this was my thought, maybe we're coming at it from the wrong direction. Maybe the movement of the poles, and in the case of the Hapgood model, it's not, let's be clear on it, it's not the entire mass of the earth that's shifting. Right. It's, it's the, it's the crust, Crustal right? Shift, yeah. Presumably, I'm guessing the asthenosphere is the boundary layer yep. between the mantle and the lower crust. Is that feasible for the entire crust to shift? That's the question. The objections would say that the that the friction between the crust and the mantle, even though it's riding on the asthenosphere, is so huge that it would take a tremendous force to to cause that to to begin to move with respect to each other. But suppose that we say that a pole shift or a modified pole shift is not and and again like you said um he's proposing these first proposing these ideas in the 50s so this is 20 years before plate tectonics continental drift is even being accepted right which wasn't really even considered dogma until the uh, till the 1970s okay yeah and that's so uh, the the path of the pole which is the revised version of the original book earth shifting crust uh, was published maybe in 69, something like that. So right right there at the 70s. I think it was actually later than that. Maybe it was. I think it was. It right. was. I think yeah. it was like 76. Maybe it was. I can look it up. Good. Okay, so what if we're looking at it from the wrong end? I think now here what Kyle, you just said, could an impact trigger it? Well, perhaps through a cascading series of secondary consequences. You have something, whether it's an impact or the sun or some combination thereof, causes a very rapid melting of the ice sheets. Okay, okay. now we've had extensive discussions about the phenomena of isostatic uh, adjustment of the Earth's crust, mm -hmm. which has to be, to me, contrasted with the, the lateral movement, which is continental drift, Isostatic, which is horizontal, basically, or more or less you could think of as tangent to the to the sphere of the Earth, whereas isostatic adjustment is the vertical, right? Well, I would think that it would they would of necessity have to be interconnected, that one could affect the other, because if you think about the Earth spinning on its axis, the equatorial bulge is thirteen miles greater, farther away from the the center of Earth's mass than the pole. So that means that there is a distance, a vertical distance that changes with latitude. Right. Okay, so now what happens if you change the vertical distance by thousands of feet? Is it possible that there then has to be an accompanying adjustment in the latitudinal position of that crustal mass that is now, I mean, we know that Hudson Bay has raised up maybe as much as 2,000 feet. Well, what that means is that if it's in more or less equilibrium, you know, if we calculate the distance from the Earth's center of mass to its surface under the center of the of a mile and a half thick ice sheet, and then in a geological time frame, we instantaneously remove that ice sheet now the land starts rebounding as it's moving away from thousands of feet from the Earth's center of mass. 
Now, is it is it possible that it is not in equilibrium anymore and it would almost require an adjustment laterally of the Earth's crust to try to seek a new equilibrium? Because now it's yeah. like, you know, you see what I'm trying to get with I this? Do, yeah. So that the, the accelerated plate tectonics may be a consequence rather than the cause of the catastrophe that caused right. the disruption, the destruction of the ice sheet and the gigantic melting and all of that. Um, because okay. we certainly. Sorry, the dates. Originally. So the original version, oh, the original Earth, version, okay. Earth's shifting crust was 1958. Path of the Pole was published. The revised version basically was published 1970. 70. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. He was wor he, You get the idea when you're reading it that he's working on the on this uh, revised version in 69. You know, uh, uh -huh. 68, 69. But then a lot of the stuff is from the original version from 58, which he has decades of work into that. Right. And in between there, he worked on maps of the ancient sea kings. 1966 is when that was published. That was awesome, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I'd forgotten about that. But, yeah, I've got a, an original beautiful copy of that book. Yeah, but the, so the other thing I was going to say is, uh, you know, you're talking about the asthenosphere, and he, go, he has a whole section where he's talking about the, the, the friction, and, like, there's, there's a measurable, and this, again, this is probably some of its old science, but, yes, there's friction between the, the crust and the mantle and the asthenosphere, but that uh, it's still, you can calculate the force necessary to get it moving. Uh -huh. And then one thing, I don't, can't remember if he mentions this or not, I don't think he does, but like one way to overcome friction uh, and make something move easily when it wouldn't otherwise is vibration. Right. Yeah. So if, if the earth is being bombarded in a series of impacts over a long period and it sets up vibrations within the entire inner inner you know body of the earth then it maybe it would make the uh the crust easier to move well you know, it, to overcome the friction so maybe it would be the same principle that you know when you you know when you have mass wasting events in mountains landslides and things or even the formation of submarine canyons yeah. right uh, and, and you have these turbidity currents which are create the turbidites which are these huge massive deposits that looked like they were laid down by you know turbulent waters well if you've got that you've got the situation where two two things can trigger a, la a big landslide one excessive rainfall which saturates the ground and makes it makes it not so adhesive and the other thing is seismic shaking they can either one working separately or Together, yeah. Well, it can, and certainly together. When you have saturated ground, and then you have seismic shaking, yeah, yeah it's almost inevitable that you're going to get large mass wasting. The 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 shear friction is going to be overcome, and you're going to have uh, one really... massive section of land sliding over the other one. Is that called liquefaction? Is I'm thinking the right thing? Is that yeah, yeah, earthquakes? Yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. with yeah. The, yeah, fluidity, and it's able to move and slide and slip easier in those few moments. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, can that happen on a grand scale, continental scale, not regional or localized? Yeah, and get that whole crust to, to move. I remember reading, uh, I don't think it was one of those books, though I did read Path of the Pole and was going through your episodes, uh, the book report, great job, and I, I want to finish that, um, all 11 episodes. But yeah, it was like comparing uh, if the earth was a basketball, then the lithosphere is, say, 7 to 27 miles thick is like a sheet of paper uh -huh. covering yes. the basketball. So it's really, you know, super thin. Yeah. But the just the forces, uh, it's just so massive. But the earth is massive itself. So, yeah, maybe yeah, it he, can be overcome. That's right. He actually spends a lot of time. He says that critics talk to him about the equatorial bulge and he's like they're saying look you can't just slide this stuff around because yeah. it has to over it has to slide over this bulge and that would cause <clears throat> you not you don't just have a friction problem you have a, a shape issue yeah that was cool because he he talks about the uh, tensile strength of the crust too so when if it's moving from a 
you know, from a position at the pole down towards the equatorial budge, bulge, it actually has to spread out. Yes. Right. So it's got, there's like tensile strength mm. in the rock, but it's easy to just pull much easier to pull it apart than the compression or what is it? The, the, uh, crush strength. Yeah. The crush some, strength of stone is high. Ridiculously the tensile high. strength is low. Yeah. So that compression it, it, strength. It actually, yeah. Compression strength. It takes, uh, so it sort of sets up this. He's like, he's like when it's moving away from the equator, uh, the bulge, it makes mountains. Yes. It has yes, to compress. Yes. When it's moving towards it, it makes these, it makes these, R you know, rift. ravines, like rifts. Rift yes. valleys. Yeah. Yeah. And he shows these patterns of rift valleys and just like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's such a great book. It's so good. Now, is that like the stretch marks along the mid Atlantic Ridge? Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's really cool. Yep. Let me and, uh, do it. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you... where, are we, where are we on time? We're, we may we're need to almost take a break an hour. Here. Almost okay. an hour. Yeah, here. it's yeah. break time, Randall. We can, we, you want to take a break and come back? Yeah, I was going to do a share, share screen. screen. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Perfect time for a break then. We'll okay. do All a share right. screen after we come back. All right. We'll be right back, folks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, uh, Cosmography 101 today. Uh, still talking about Charles Hapgood and Path of the Pole, and I think maybe there's a question about ancient rock bands being evidence for, possible evidence for That's right. One crustal of the, shift. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the interesting things, I'll just sort of go through it real quick. That yeah, please Hapgood, do. Yeah, that Hapgood mentions in his book. He actually goes through it in detail that there are uh, deep sediments that appear to have climatic bands, B-A-N-D-S, uh, that are not aligned with our current axis. And he says that this is evidence that the crust has shifted, uh, putting those climatic bands out of alignment with the current axis. Mm hmm Yeah. So ancient rock bands. Proof. Yeah, and we're not talking about... Shifts. We're not talking about the Grateful Dead or Deep Purple. Or <laughs> are those guys considered ancient already? <laughs> well, Maybe Mick Jagger is. is. Yeah, Keith, Mick Jagger. Okay, Mick Jagger. You're right. And Keith Richards. Yeah, I would think they qualify as. <laughs> are you, is Mick Jagger from the Shifting Stones? <laughs> you got to listen. You got to hand it to those guys, especially Mick Jagger. I saw this thing where when they do a two and a half hour show. And he doesn't stop dancing and prancing. It's like whatever going up. But, you know, he runs long distance oh, he's in marathon. order to get in shape yeah. and yeah, other okay. things. Yeah. To, to, yeah. So that's, you got to look. I mean, who could have Respect. imagined yeah, that? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It is. It really is. Um, and Keith Richards, you know, he actually has cleaned up his act. He even quit smoking a couple of years ago. No. The guy who was never seen without a cigarette quit smoking. And he still sounds like death warmed over. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mike. Uh, I always got to have the cynic. I know. No, <laughs> I'm not cynic. I was. I was. I, I was admiring I his 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 perseverance, his survival I, skill. I, so here is my uh, copy. Still, you know, still with the with the library. There we go. Oh, you stole it. I didn't steal it. <laughs> I told you it was on a library used book sale for a dollar. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. mm. Probably one of the best dollar or two that I ever spent in my open life. Open it up. Show After me. you put it on that shelf. Yeah, show me it doesn't have a library card in there with a stamp <laughs> from 1972. <laughs> no. <laughs> it does not. Randall is just like, I'm going to just set this here for a little bit. <laughs> and and while you're looking at thinking about their question... Mike, I have a question too about the, the shifting crust idea. How does the core play in all this? How does the, how does the iron core figure in all this? Is it, it's got to be shifting around too? No, 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 no. Yeah, the 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 mantle and the core are not. They don't change. The crust itself just slides over the top of these. You know, like a, like across the top of these things. They're they're a, sort of a, in a liquid state. The core itself. Is not obviously, but they don't they don't change. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see if we can. So it's rotating though at a at a different speed than the outer mantle around it. Though, have you guys heard that in the last ten, fifteen years? Mm. It's not oh. all moving, spinning, rotating together. It's yeah. Well, I know. I know it's supposed to have rates. Yeah, it's supposed to, and it's supposed to have like flows. And Hapgood spent a lot of time talking about that. The movements of the amount of material. You know, when you're talking about trillions of tons of molten rock moving oh, around in yeah. these yeah in these uh like mantle flows you know uh i don't remember all the details but he does mention how how much material that is got like you've got these huge flows of of rock and th that's running along under underneath the crust it's pushing on it as well so the other thing i would say before we get off the topic of hapgood is and we mentioned this in the break, is that people seem to get hung up on Hapgood's proposed mechanism and say, like, ah, oh, this can't work. You know, that's been disproven. Like, the idea that if mm -hmm. there's ice at the poles and they get out of, a, uh, they're un imbalanced, and that is what moves it. But that's just his proposed mechanism for how it might start. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the mechanism doesn't end up working, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, all this evidence he's found that seems to show that... yeah. Well, that the crust may have shifted or that it's at least different now than it or it was different in the past than it is now it doesn't change. It's sort of like the, what they did with Brett's, you know, like where they start demanding, like, well, where's the water? Yeah. Where are you going to get all this water from? It doesn't matter. You have evidence that the water is there. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, if you can't tell me where the water came from, then it didn't. Then there was no water here. Yeah, exactly. You know? So and it's that, like Hap, Hapgood's mechanism. Yeah. Hapgood's mechanism may not work, but that doesn't mean that he didn't come like show a lot of evidence that this these events may have taken place. Well, if you look in his bibliography, I was way off. It's 456 entries. Oh yeah. In his bibliography. And uh so I used man that did his research. Man did his research, yeah. And when I got this book, uh one of the things I set out to do was to get a we acquire as many of these references, track as many of them down as I possibly could. And I got a bunch of them. I probably got three quarters of them. And that is what is in some of that is what's in those bound volumes because we didn't have PDFs and digital downloads in the seventies and eighties. So it's easy for to do research now. Back then, there was, you know, it could, it was a life and death matter. I mean, you could literally die <laughs> on your way to the library <laughs> if you weren't, if you were not careful when you were jaywalking. Yeah. So yep. Randall could have very easily just been a skeleton in the corner of the library, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we may never in, have learned any of in, the stuff yeah. in cobwebs. <laughs> Surrounded by obscure tomes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. His one hand stuck in the Xerox machine. <laughs> <laughs> it could have happened. There were times, I tell you, when I'm like, I'm getting in zombie mode there. Blah, blah. And then, you know, uh, blah. oh, shit, that one got crooked. I got to redo it. Blah, blah. Anyhow, I want to do a quick share screen here because, um, you know, let's see. Okay, let's try. Uh, Randall's day 45, water supplies low, <laughs> still copying book number six. <laughs> <laughs> I, all right. Are you guys He's, seeing this? We are, we are seeing, seeing this, this, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Elevated so, and abandoned shorelines along Hudson wow. Bay. Yeah. Well, going way back to 1896, proofs of the rising of the land around Hudson Bay. Uh, the uh, Just from Lake Huron, let's see, uh, 1,300 miles from Lake Huron, the increase in elevation might there amount to 1,000 or 2,000 feet. Um, so anyways, this is where the maximum rise was, was Hudson Bay. Here's another view of these elevated shorelines. And this one here. Uh, 
I copied out of a journal many years ago. It'd be good to get some original photographs. Um, but you see, here's the the bay down here, and then it kind of almost looks like it's sloping downward here, but it's actually sloping up. And one of the things that comes out when you look at these the shorelines and the spacing is that there's greater spacing amongst the earlier ones. Um, so that, and then as you're getting into the later ones, the spacing is much closer. What that is telling us is that the rate of isostatic adjustment was at its maximum immediately after the the deglaciation. So, so can I ask a question here? Of like course. these, does this mean that the whole lake was is moving? I don't know, southward or whatever, away from these lines. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, in other words, there aren't corresponding lines on the other side. Yes, there are. There are. Yeah. It's so from the water, isostatic. So the water is staying in a pocket and the land around it is lifting up. Is that what's happening? Pretty much. And but but also what is happening is that originally, after the deglaciation, the Hudson Bay was a giant freshwater sea that was not connected to the ocean. So somewhere in that uplifting process. It drained. It drained. And it okay. probably it probably occurred because there was ice masses blocking the the exit of Hudson Bay, maybe to the north. There was rig, residual ice. Uh what is it? The uh the bay there, um where I think they, they think most of the drainage occurred. I've forgotten the name, but anyways, there is one know. yeah, there is a uh uh a Oh, what is it? There, there, there's a channel, a large channel up there that um, where Lake Agassiz drained, or Hudson no, Bay, or was it the same thing at the at that time? It was probably not the same thing. Until I can tell you in a second, I got it right here in front of me. If I can just scroll up, this was um, let's see, up into the Arctic Sea, the, the Hudson Strait. Okay. That's what it would have been. The Hudson Strait. It drained out through the Hudson Strait. And I could actually close this share screen. Here you can see Hudson Bay. And this was pretty much the center of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which reached all the way here into Alberta. And actually, at the late glacial maximum, it sort of bumped up against the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. They, the two of them merged uh temporarily right along here along uh east of the rocky mountain front but anyways this is the strait right here it's hudson strait i couldn't remember but that's what it is hudson strait right here which was considered the main drainage out um at the same time that the salt water because now hudson bay is connected to the ocean and it's salt water but in the immediate aftermath of the deglaciation it was freshwater and not connected to the ocean. So somewhere, the amount of water increasing in the bay, the rise of sea level, and the diminishment of the ice all reached the point where the sep whatever was separating Hudson Bay from the North Atlantic was gone, and they were able to establish this flow through here, which is Hudson Strait. And this area, I believe, if I recall the models, was still glaciated at that time. So the water wasn't flowing out through the what they call the Northwest Passages. It was flowing pretty much out through Hudson Strait. And Lake Agassiz was all in this area and came down. And Bradley and I visited the southern outlet of Lake Agassiz when we were carrying Graham across the country uh, when he was researching magicians of the gods and the outlet this bump right here is kind of a legacy of that outlet when i was a kid i would look at minnesota maps and i would always wonder why is there a big pimple here on the western boundary of of minnesota i said why didn't they just make a straight line here well because the border is following the erosional channel let's zoom in and see if we can see it the border it's is big following stone lake. Big Stone Lake, exactly. The border is following the channel, the drainage channel of Lake Agassiz. That's what it's doing. And this this was, yeah, you can see here now. Now, these, of course, are lakes. So 
they're not giving you and here you can see the the river flow in in the channel and again here's classic underfit river you see so obviously this here that we're looking at this flowing water right here did not carve this channel here this channel this big old channel here is a result of the catastrophic drainage of lake agassiz the other drainage of lake agassiz and interestingly this drainage here dates based on the work of um oh uh, it'll come to me in a second uh um yeah uh occurred right at the younger driest boundary and then if we zoom out and go up here to canada the other outlet is up here was that teller or he was farther north teller that was teller thank you brad that was teller so here actually and we probably are gonna need to do a recon trip up here at some point because this is all scab land and it's gigantic outrush of the catastrophic draining of Lake Agassiz North into the Arctic Ocean. Um, and it's dated right at the lower Younger Dryas boundary. So, yeah, this is all scab land in here. Uh, you know, major evidence of gigantic water flows to the north. Now, that's that's interesting to think about, too, is that you're draining into the Arctic Ocean just after the ice sheets were like, you know, two miles thick. Mm -hmm. Why weren't, why wasn't there ice in the Arctic? Like, but how, do, how is it just draining? I don't know. That's just strange to think about. Yeah. That it's draining north into a place that should have been frozen solid. Mm hmm. Well, of course, now the difference is that the Arctic. Is it, as it says right here, it's an ocean. Yeah, it's not landlocked. I get it, but I'm. However, just... however, during the late glacial maximum, this over here was a continuous landmass, so there was no warm Pacific water then, like there is now, flowing through Bering Strait right here, and all of this was blocked off with ice, so there was no flow here. So any flow into the Arctic Ocean would have been up through here. They're what they're calling the Norwegian Sea. I should go to Google Earth. Yeah, I mean, that outlet you're talking about is, you know, I mean, there's there's all those islands. It just seems like there would be miles of ice in there. It just seems like a weird place for it to be draining. Well, yeah, and I think obviously the, uh, the Earth wasn't, I mean, the, the Arctic Ocean wasn't completely frozen over. Yeah. So if I zoom out, they've they've made some changes to Google Earth, which I'm still figuring out here. But I'm going to zoom out. Oh, we're not get oriented north. There we go. We can go up here to the drainage of. Here we go. Let's see. So here you see the Mackenzie River, and again here you can you can see the channel. So this this was the the channel conveying meltwater, and this is the modern Mackenzie River, which is not a trivial river, but, and you can see all of these other rivers that have created this anastomosing pattern on the floodplain. We can come down here. And you can see this is where the drainage into the Arctic Ocean was. So this would be a very interesting place to explore and get some drone. I don't know of anybody studying uh, ancient giant floods who has done much up here other than Teller and some of his colleagues, but their work certainly has not made it into uh, any of the mainstream. So yeah, there was a major flow north through the Mackenzie into the Arctic Ocean. And of course, yeah, a look, huge look, delta out there. Yeah, there's a huge delta. This is your delta here. Then you've got your coastal shelf and look how wide it is. And most of this shelf would have been uh, above water. And then 
over here, this is where it gets interesting. You know, you think of the Bering Land Bridge. I remember my first concept of the Bering Land Bridge was I looked at the maps and I thought, okay, there was a piece of land, you know, connecting these two here. But in reality, it was the larger part of this whole continental shelf yeah. that formed the lost ecosystem of Beringia. And then, like we talked about in the first half of the podcast, this area was supporting a tremendous biomass. While the other side of the world over here was completely buried under thousands of feet of ice. So there's a lot of things that have yet to be explained and worked out in the history of this planet. Um, so I will stop share for the moment. So let's see. What else? Oh, well, it's uh, October. So within the next few weeks, Earth will be entering the Torrid Meteor Stream. Draconids. Well, the Draconids come first, but there's actually a little bit of an overlap between the Draconids and the Torrids. Um, because the, the Draconids are a much more confined meteor stream, and the Torrids are a huge diffuse meteor stream. So we actually start going into the outer edges of the Torrid Stream like the second or third week in October. But then we cross the midpoint of the stream like that first week in November. So we'll be doing our Cumberland tour. We'll be uh, up there in the Cumberland tour on Halloween during the peak of the Torrid Meteor Shower. So hopefully we'll catch some Torrid. The Torrid stream every once in a while catches some really spectacular fireballs. And probably those are just a mere remnant of a remnant of what would have occurred in millennia past when the Torrid Meteor Stream was a much younger stream. Um, and of course, now, you know, in terms of what we were talking about, the Younger Dryas boundary, um, like uh, William Napier, who's in the Comet Research Group, po totally supported the idea that it could have been part of the Torrid Meteor Stream that the Earth encountered uh, that was the Younger Dryas impacts, which I find extremely interesting, particularly when you realize that how the important role mythologically that the Torrids would have played. And, you know, it brings into the whole issue of the symbolism and mythology of the bull. And, and the you Pleiades. recall the, the imagery of Mithras slaying the bull, don't you? And yes. if you look at, you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the traditional depictions of, of Taurus the bull, the Pleiades, which is the radiant point or very close to the radiant point of the Taurid family of meteor streams is the shoulder of the bull. That can't just be a coincidence, can it? I remember you breaking down some, uh, Old images of the um, the bull being yeah, slain. The and stuff. Yeah. There's yeah. all these symbols or all these little characters all around, and I'm still wondering what it all means, Randall. Well, then I guess we should circle <laughs> back to it because it, you know, it it's it's part of this whole um, this whole complex of things that we've inherited from the past. Uh, whether it's, you know, the, the Mithraic tradition, which is rich, the Eleusinian mysteries or the Masonic traditions or the Kabiri or the Templars, there's all of these various groups who it seems like some of their primary purpose in existing was in the preservation and amplification and transmission of knowledge. Knowledge of certain kind, and one of the vehicles for transmitting knowledge was certainly symbolism and mythology and so on. Maybe we could segue into the time we've got left here. Um, let's see, I'm going to close this. I mainly want to understand why the scorpion is doing what it's doing. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. We've never gotten an answer to the scorpion question. I do not question. understand that at all. The scorpion question. <laughs> Well, first Behind of all, the scenes episode. 
Okay, first of all, the Scorpion, you know, obviously, I think the place to you have to look is, okay, astronomically, what's the significance of Scorpio and Sagittarius? And part of that is the fact that the galactic center right yeah. there sits right, right on there. the cusp of Sagittarius. And it's almost the, the traditional depictions of Sagittarius drawing his bow. The arrow almost points, points yeah. right at the center of the galaxy. So I think we need to be looking at some connection with the galactic center there, hmm. maybe as a clue to um, okay, and to, yeah, more about yuds and seeds, yuds and seeds, yes, yeah, yuds, yuds and seeds. Sure, we should we should look at that, and then we're probably going to need to wrap it up because I can see Brad's water has turned into wine. <laughs> so. <laughs> We don't hey. have much time left. Cranberry <laughs> juice, but okay. <laughs> he had a cup of water, and then he picked up that same cup. It's now definitely wine. So. Well, cranberry, okay. cranberry juice, totally. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the some of the themes I would like to explore in you know upcoming episodes. This is a, a paper that came out actually way back in 2000, but it's still completely relevant. And it's the title of the paper is this, Poseidon's Horses, Plate Tectonics, okay, relevant to our discussion, and Earthquake Storms, Plate Tectonics and Earthquake Storms in the Late Bronze Age, Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and so that's what this is about. And it's quite interesting. Uh, it says here, uh, a new study of earthquakes occurring in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean region during the 20th century, utilizing data recorded since the invention of seismic tracking devices shows that this area is crisscrossed with crisscrossed with major fault lines and that numerous temblors of magnitude 6.5, enough to destroy modern buildings, let alone those of antiquity, occur frequently. It can be demonstrated that such major earthquakes often occur in groups known as sequences or storms in which one large quake is followed days, months, or even years later by others elsewhere on the now-weakened fault line. When a map of the areas in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean region affected, i.e. were shaken, by 20th century AD earthquakes of magnitude 6.5 and greater, and within an intensity of 7 or greater, is overlaid on Robert Drew's map, of sites destroyed in those same regions during the catastrophe near the end of the late Bronze Age, it is readily apparent that all of these LBA, late Bronze Age sites, lie within the affected high shaking areas. How's that for interesting? And so now uh, it gets into... Um, the geophysical evidence, and then what happened to the settlements and urban areas that were involved in this shaking. And then the other part of it is, is something of uh, would be a great theme to follow up on, is the repeated correlations from archaic and ancient accounts of celestial visitations and earthquakes. Um, so in this one, it goes into some of the, yeah, the archaeological evidence, which is very compelling. Um, Mycenae, uh, what happened there with these buildings that collapsed? It's very clear that there was a catastrophic destruction during the late Bronze Age, which calls falls very close to the Taurus Aries cusp in the great wheel, in the great year, usually dated at 42 to 4,300 years, which pretty much is right there on that transition from the age of Taurus into the age of Aries, which would have occurred, you know, 
use it using the the classical sacred numbers would be 4320 4320 but then yeah. what do you measure what's the zero point you're measuring from you know just like the younger dryas falls very very close to the halfway point within the within the great year 12960 but it's actually dated about 1 century earlier than than that halfway point but the halfway point you got to decide well where's the zero we're measuring from you know and i don't know the answer to that and probably nobody else does either other than you have to look at it within a within a, a band within a margin of error and i think that one of the one of the messages that the ancient systems that uh, the ancient traditions of knowledge are trying to preserve for us is that that great year model can actually be used as a predictive mechanism for knowing when the vulnerable phases are occurring. Not that it's going to occur on a specific date, like May 5th of the year 2000, but that it may occur within a window that might be several centuries on either side. Because after all, this is nature. This is not a, a uh, you know, it's not a human construct. It's not a machine in the sense that it's going to have precision timing any more than, you know, in a northern latitude, what's going to be the date of the first fall freeze, like where I grew up in Minnesota? Well, we can predict within a week and usually be 100% right that it's going to occur within this week, but not to the day and certainly not to the time, right? Well, so there's, yeah, there's some stuff to look at here. Um, and then we can get into some symbolism because so much of the symbolism is bound up in catastrophes. Um, so yeah, like there's a photograph of the city wall of Mycenae included in its lower part in its foundation. And as its foundation, a natural fault scarp dipping here at 60 degrees or so. Uh, even a very modest earthquake on this vault would cause the wall to tumble and render it ineffective for defense against attack later. And, uh, yeah, they're basically like, oh, I, I got to share this. Uh, this is pretty incredible here. Let me uh, enlarge this, and then I'll share it. And, and you'll see that this is... Uh, this is the kind of things that they're that they're finding in these. Okay, so what they're finding is the walls have toppled over and killed people, and their skeletal remains are still there under the rubble. Uh. <sighs> yeah, this kind of puts it into perspective. Very interesting paper that we could we can get into more as we come up here. And so these were the walls, but here's what was part of the walls. So the walls have just been pretty much demolished. Yeah. Those are the foundations of the walls. Yes. And then these all these rocks, broken rocks strewn all around, they were the walls. Right. So uh, here we go. Tilted eastern and western walls within building six. See the the walls are tilted in. Yeah, you can see the tilt inwards. there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this was a very interesting time. I mean, this Bronze Age collapse probably set history back at least a millennium, at least, because all of the cultured civilizations around the Mediterranean pretty much all collapsed about the same time. So. Whatever happened, it was an impressive event. And there's evidence that suggests that, you know, okay, obviously here you've got, you know, earthquakes, swarms, or what he, the authors are calling storms, earthquake storms, but they're happening at the same time that there's stuff happening all over the world. So what triggered that 4,300 years ago? And then, of course, now we have the studies on Abu Herrera which you are, of course, are familiar with. And let's talk for a minute about, just for a second, we can get into it more as we're all reading them. Um, and that is the papers 
that are not getting published, papers that are being co-authored by some of the finest, most knowledgeable minds on Earth about cosmically induced catastrophism, and they're being rejected by mainstream mainstream scientific Turtles. press. And, you know, I talked to George Howard today, and he put it this way. He says, it's always been challenging to get these kind of catastrophist evidence into the mainstream journals, but we did it. However, now it's impossible. So why has it become impossible? I think that's an important question. So they're doing an end run, and I think this is amazing. They're started, They're going to open source all of their papers from now on. And we've got four papers. I'll get Laura to post links to them so anybody who's interested can go in and download freely these four papers, and they're game-changing papers. Uh, really, really good stuff. Yeah, I've got them. I've got the little synopses pulled up here. What do you got? Uh, one there. is microstructures and shocked quartz linking nuclear air bursts and meteorite impacts. And then uh, three Abu Herrera parts, uh, yeah. papers, part one, part two, and part three. Uh, shock fractured quartz grains support 12,800 year old cosmic air bursts at the Younger Dryas onset. Paper two, additional evidence supporting the catastrophic destruction of this prehistoric village by a cosmic airburst 12,800 years ago. And part three, comet airburst triggering major climate change 12,800 years ago that initiated the transition to agriculture. Yeah, I mean, this is really, really interesting stuff um, that these guys are doing. And they can't get it published in the mainstream journals. And you look... If you look at the names, these people are some of the top in the world in their field, but they can't get published in the mainstream scientific press. I think that raises a whole host of questions that I suspected we were going to be seeing in the aftermath of when I saw the mainstream press and the, the mainstream archaeological response to Ancient Apocalypse, the Graham, Graham Hancock series that I was in in the last episode taking the camera crew around some of the sites of the uh the great floods in the channel scab lands and if you guys recall we talked about that and what i think is clearly evidence of a central script being uh being disseminated amongst the the, the archaeological profession amongst the journalists that this is what you're going to say you're going to say that he's promoting white supremacy that he's denigrating the role of of ancient cultures that he's a racist that he's promoting conspiracy theories all of that stuff kept recurring over and over again in all of the attacks now i think that what they're doing is we're seeing perhaps something that's a part of that whole same process because it looks like they're very scared that their whole contrived narrative is going to get exposed especially if people start going realizing that Wait a second. We're in a climate crisis. If we're in a climate crisis right now, then what was the younger Dryas? If things right. are happening faster now than they've ever happened before, what about ice core evidence that shows 10 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit in five years or less? Wait a second. Then it's not, if that's true, then things can't be happening faster than they've ever happened before. Um, and those kind of questions, I think it's it's about the fear that people are going to start looking and recognize how dynamic. We're just talking here about the Bronze Age collapse, okay? Uh, but the idea that not only was there earthquake storms, but there was also major climatic changes at that same century around the entire planet. So something was going on that not only involved the, the tectonic structure of the Earth itself, the, the lithosphere, it also involved the atmosphere and the climate. Well, what, what exactly happened? Was it volcanism? Was it impacts? What was it that, that caused these changes? Massive droughts found around the world that caused the collapse of the Chimer civilization, uh, the early classical Mayan. Uh, we find the imprint of these this this Bronze Age collapse all over the planet. 
Well, see, here's the thing. If you're going to believe so much that we're now facing an impended, impending human-caused climate doom, that you're all going out and gluing yourselves to the interstates, it means that people, there's a lot of people who are pretty far invested in this narrative. And you can't have the people who are on the margins, who are sitting on the fence, asking questions like this. Well, if we're in a climate crisis now, what was the Bronze Age? collapse? What was the Bronze Age catastrophe? What was the Younger Dryas catastrophe? What were the other four or five climate catastrophes that we can now document just in the Holocene? See, those are questions that shouldn't be asked. And I think that somewhere in this mix, there is a political agenda. I mean, why? Because this is really solid, important, interesting, valuable science that these guys are doing. You know, Dr. Moore, James Kennett, Napier, LeCompte. Remember, LeCompte was, he came on the Joe Rogan show with the great debate with Michael Shermer. Remember Michael LeCompte? I mean, Malcolm LeCompte was was our guy. He came on in our corner. And then you guys weren't there. Brad, were you there with the the the, the scientific roundtable a few years ago? Organized by George Howard. Yeah, where we went? down in Wilmington and Graham. Yeah, 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 you were there. Yeah. Yeah, so you met Malcolm. Sure. You met uh, Chris Moore. Chris, yeah. Yeah, you met Chris, these guys. And the fact and that Tony these... Zamora was there, yeah. Tony Zamora was there. The fact that these guys who are heavyweights in their field can't get published, to didn't me, they, that... I mean, what's going on there? Didn't they tell us at the time, though, that they were, one of the blockages was they had to pay to get published, that there was, like, costing thousands of dollars? Well, yeah. So you there's know, that. lots of times the, your university will pay for that, but it was like it was uh, kind of up to these individuals or, you know, that were part of the Comet Research Group and they were having to pay. And that was, you know, like yeah, the yeah. first way of keeping yeah. them from getting their work out. And now it's just like, OK, well, it's just totally shut off. And, and it just outwardly seems that politics is, is running science here controlling yeah, what exactly. actually is the new the new terms of evidence that comes out is, is dictated by politics. I think you're exactly right, Brad. Um, and as distasteful as that is, that is to me, because I hate politics, it's what's going on now. But but there are there are strategies because I think in the end they're they're going to lose um, because they don't have reality and truth on their side. So they have to. I think they know on some level instinctively that they've built a house of cards and it encompasses so many different things now, all aspects of life in civilized world today that, and they even said in one of the, I, I should quote this, but I won't do it now. In one of those hit pieces on Graham, and it might've been Dibble who said it. If you believe Graham Hancock's conspiracy theories about ancient catastrophism, well, you might believe that the VAP uh, is is phony. You might believe that that uh, 9-11 was a conspiracy theory. I mean, it literally said that. If you the believe doctors this... Doctors would lie to you. Yes, you would believe that doctors would lie to you. You might even believe, and this is ex almost exact quote, you might even believe that politicians would lie to you. No, seriously. Oh, my God. People actually believe that? That's crazy. Well, That's a huge conspiracy. Take, I mean, think about that, though. So they've got to attack ancient apocalypse. And, and and if you read any of the attacks, there was no substance to any of them. There was no effort to actually refute, um, refute the actual evidence. It was just a hit piece against Graham. So, yeah. It, and now we, well, look, now they're pulling... Pulling the thing on Russell Brand, not to get off on that conversation, but but look what what he's been doing the last couple of years. He's got six and a half million viewers now, and he's talking about the bullshit, the bullshit that's coming out of Washington and the rest of the the, the you know the governments. And so yeah, I mean, I, a lot of people actually predicted this, saying they're going to come after Russell if, if at some point his audience is going to grow to the point that they're going to come after him. And, and that was your... the first person uh, Tucker Carlson talked to after he got ousted from Fox. And those yeah. were some really powerful interviews. I watched those. With Russell Brand. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen those, but I bet they were. Yeah, I mean, he he wasn't afraid to speak out. And this is the thing that can't be allowed now. People are not supposed to speak out and exercise their first amendment. And, and it's spilling over into everything. That's why we're sitting here talking about having to open source these papers that have been authored by the Comet Research Group because they cannot get mainstream scientific press to publish them. And they've yeah, tried. So, so if you want to support... Uh, one one way to do it is to check out the papers. The links will be, I guess, in the show notes and uh, spread them around, share them with with your friends. But also, you can support the Comet Research Group by donating. Yep. yep. Uh, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast is we're monthly donators to the uh, the Comet Research Group. You can go to their website, cometresearchgroup.org slash donate. Um, simple website, great website. Uh, they take PayPal. So that, that really helps. Like that's the point. Like they, they have to pay. Yeah. And a lot of these, it's, a lot of this research is being done out of their pockets. It's yeah. not yes. university funded. It's right. like, right. it's rogue science at this point, which is crazy. It's, I yeah. know. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So these guys like, you know, they came to the, the cosmic summit, um, people like George Howard trying to connect, you know, sort of this, this podcasting world to these, these scientists doing really good work. And, uh, all of you people out there who support podcasts, support those yeah, guys. Support I mean, these guys, cause they're doing the stuff we talk about. I mean, like, yeah. this is, they're mm -hmm. doing the work. So, and we're, we've gotten to know a lot of them over yeah. the years. And so we're kind of going to, anything that they do, they discover, we're going to kind of be on the first tier of getting that information that we then would share on our podcast and all the things that we're doing. Um, so yes, uh, definitely. And, and I got a personal thank you from Alan West. Uh, so he said that somebody heard me talking about Comet Research Group. I got to get the details from him on Joe Rogan and donated, uh, I think he said it was one and a half million dollars. Oh, oh my right. God. That's great. Nice. <laughs> That's nice. awesome. Yeah, so they're going to they've got some plans in the works for that and we will be get to have front, Hiawatha. Yeah, we'll have front row seats. Well, I've got That's awesome. I've got a scenario coming up where I, you know, I've been working on it. Brad kind of knows where I'm going with it, but um I think we can at this point now we can we can make a pretty strong case of where the impact occurred. Uh, are we doing that on episode several. 102? Yeah, can we do that on episode 102? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Why are you holding out on us? Trying to get out. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, it. whether it's 102 or 103, or maybe it'll be 108, I don't know. Uh, but it'll, it'll be... Uh, I see. Oh, I <laughs> well, wait Randall. a second. Hold on. <laughs> 108 it is. I, I, got, I got to be careful about <laughs> what I say we're going to talk about, because... Brad is monitoring everything I say. <laughs> Multiple <laughs> times. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, Randall, but it's being recorded. Like we have uh, yeah. evidence. Yeah. <laughs> we can play you clips <laughs> of you saying. I know. Stuff. I know. That's that's come to his yes, attention. Don't, I I feel the pressure. I do. I it's like, okay, gosh darn it, I can't. But no, it's one of the things that I think is right up there with the moon stuff. Mike obviously really wants it to happen as well. Look at him. Well, you can Look. tell by the way he's trembling. <laughs> and at that round table in Wilmington, Randall did show it to the common research scientists that were there. But they weren't ready for it yet. Uh, they weren't. Oh. But yeah, it's been disseminated slightly. Yeah. Initially. Yeah. Initially. Yeah. And we do have, yeah, we do have it on record, don't we? And that was recorded. Also, <laughs> Brad, yeah. Brad follows the rules I was there. Yeah. I was there. Laid right. down by Tenacious D. That's flip right. that on switch. Randall talks, flip on the on switch. <laughs> last record thing. Record everything. You know? Last thing. I'll just remind everyone that uh, Sacred Geometry International website is selling my stuff and it's a total fraud. And he's trying to ride on our coattails as our numbers go up. He's trying to optimize so that he can ride right along on our coattails and embezzle as much money as he can out of my work uh, before the hammer drops. But if anybody here uh, 
is interested uh, in, in helping this, just spread the word that Sacred Geometry International is a fraudulent website, fraudulently selling my work, and it has been served with two cease and desist letters, which he has ignored and uh, has had the website shut down once, and he relocated it to Malaysia, where he believes he'll be able to get away forever and ever by profiting off of my work. So I'm just bringing this up because he has sort of ramped up his game again recently as as we're getting more and more attention and we're getting greater numbers of people uh, following what we're doing, uh, he's trying to milk it. So I want people to know about that and 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 to really to spread the word that Sacred Geometry International is a fraudulent website in terms of selling my work, which no, is no connection with Randall, no, no. remuneration, remun no. of remuneration. Yeah, no there it is. No payment to Randall from what right. is brought in through that website at all. And in about five years at this point, close to five years since I've received a penny. And uh, if you knew this guy, you would not want to give him a penny of your money. So RandallCarlson.com. RandallCarlson.com is the place to go. Yeah. Thanks. All right, All right guys. Certainly yeah. enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I was going to say, la last thing. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about the Bronze Age collapse and then the, all the climate stuff and, of course, the Younger Dryas. You have... You've said this quote on the podcast before. But I don't remember who said it. It was something like, uh, civiliz civilization exists that geological consent subject to change. Civilization exists by geological yeah. consent subject to change, change without, without notice. notice. That's it. Th yeah, that was um, the Woo. great historian, Will Durant. There you go. Uh, who wrote, what was it, an 11-volume like history of yeah, civilization? Yeah. Right. So you said that, yeah, you were saying that the that Bronze Age collapse set civilization back maybe a thousand years. Yeah. And it was maybe a swarm of earthquakes, you know, something, mm -hmm. something happened. I mean, there, there you go. Consent mm -hmm. was revoked. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Good Thanks, show. guys. Good show, guys. Yeah. Good night. All right. Good night. Thanks, gentlemen.